Uh, most of you know that my mom has had Alzheimer's for about the past 10 years and uh, with, with many humorous incidents. Uh, three or four years ago, uh, when I went over for one of my annual visits, uh, my sister picked me up at the airport. We went straight to my mom's uh, retirement home. Uh, and, and I've always been concerned about whether she would continue to recognize me and we walked in the front door, my sister and I, into the dining room and my mom spotted us from across the room and to my delight my mom's face just lit up and I walked up to her and my mom said to the wee woman sitting beside her, this is my son and I was so delighted and then he, she pointed at my sister and said, and this is his nurse. <laughs> I remind my sister of that often. In fact, I texted her this morning and reminded her of that. So uh, it, I imagine it'll be uh, sometime today, and uh, of course I'll make you aware of that by email or uh, we'll get in touch with you by phone. We'll turn to uh, John chapter 4 in your Bibles, please. We started this we series within the larger series on the Gospel of John. We started this series on true worship a couple of weeks ago on John chapter 4, verse 20 to 26. The word worship or the word worshipers shows up in this little section ten times. So it is the most theologically packed description of worship in all of the Bible, from the lips of Jesus. Jesus talks about true worshipers in verse 23. He calls us true worshipers, which implies that, of course, there is such a thing as false worshipers and false worship. There is only one true way to worship, according to Jesus. There is only one way to worship truthfully, and that is to worship the way Jesus teaches us to worship in this passage. And any worship that is practiced in any other way other than the way that Jesus taught is false worship and is a false religion. Now, we started this a few weeks ago, and we learned last time, number one, the true worship is about a person, not a place. Look at verse 20. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. This is the Samaritan woman that Jesus had the conversation with at a well. And she asked Jesus this question about worship. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. See, she thinks worship is all about a geographical location. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Now look at verse 21. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Worship has nothing to do with geographical location. But you will worship the Father. Worship is all about a person, not about a place. And we talked about that last time, and if you missed that, you can pick it up on the website, that sermon from a couple of weeks ago on true worship. Now, and we also talked about the second principle last time, number two. True worship flows out of an informed mind. Look at verse 22. You worship what you do not know. But we worship what we know. You cannot worship biblically without knowing the person whom you are worshiping. So the more that you know God and the more that you know about God, the more meaningful will be your worship. That's why the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection. That, that makes sense. The more you know somebody, the more you appreciate them and love them. So the old country and western song is wrong 
I think I love you. Won't you tell me your name? That's not real love. But that's why some of the old hymns that we sing are so helpful to worship. For example, praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet thy tribute bring. And then this line, ransom, heal, restore, forgiven. I mean, when you understand that, you just can't help but worship evermore. His praises sing. The more you know God, and the more you know what Christ did on the cross, and the more you know about all of the riches that are yours as a follower of Christ, the more the worship just pours out of you. The corollary to that is also true. If you don't know much about God, you don't know much about the Bible, you don't know much about theology, you don't know what the words of these hymns mean and what they're talking about, you really can't worship. And so that's as far as we got last time. Worship is all about a person, not a place. And secondly, Worship flows out of an informed mind. Number three. Look at the last part of verse 22. For salvation is from the Jews. There's the third principle of true worship. True worship can only be experienced by people who are saved. True worship can only be experienced if you have experienced salvation. You can only worship if you understand what salvation is. Salvation is from the Jews. Why would Jesus say that in the middle of this package of teaching on worship? Salvation comes from the Jews. Because salvation is the source of true worship. Now, salvation comes from the Jews in two senses. Here's what it means. First, it was the Jewish people who received the plan of salvation throughout the Old Testament. It was Abraham, you remember, the father of the Israelite nation, that God first said, I am going to make you into a great nation and your descendants are going to be like the stars in the sky and the sand the grains on the beach. I'm going to give you thousands and thousands and thousands of descendants. That's the covenant that God made with Abraham. And I will going to make a nation out of you that will be a blessing to the world. And that is true today. The Jewish people are at the front end of many of the medical breakthroughs that our generation experiences today. Um, Nobel laureates abound of Jewish people. The Jewish people have been a blessing to the world. But it was the Israelite nation that was enslaved in Egypt and then God set them free. And 1 Corinthians 10 says that that was an example for us. That's a picture of us being enslaved in sin. The way the Israelite people were enslaved in Egypt. And they needed a savior. They needed to be released and redeemed and healed from captivity. That was a picture for us. It was the Israelites who were given the picture of redemption through the Passover lamb. And every year the, Pass the Passover lambs were slaughtered by the thousands and blood was shed as a reminder of the blood that was put over the doorposts and the top of the door in Egypt. And then the angel of death came over the land and killed the firstborn child of every home that didn't have the blood. That was a picture that went all through the Old Testament. And in that sense... Salvation comes from the Jews. But in a far greater sense, salvation came from the Jews because the Lord Jesus Christ himself was Jewish. 
Jesus' family tree is recorded in Matthew and in Luke, and it traces all the way back through the line of kings and Zerubbabel, all the way through King David, and all the way back through Abraham. Jesus was a Jew's Jew. Salvation is of the Jews because the Israelite nation was God's chosen nation in the Old Testament. And the Israelite nation birthed the Savior of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. So in those two senses, Jesus says salvation comes from the Jews. But the point is that you can only worship if you have experienced salvation and been saved and know Jesus Christ personally. You can only worship if you have been regenerated. Titus 2.5 says, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. You cannot get to heaven by your own good works, by your own righteousness. The only way that you can get to heaven is if you get saved, if you get redeemed, if you get regenerated. You can only worship if you're a Christian. All believers can attend a worship service. We have unbelieving people in this service many, many Sunday mornings. There may be unbelievers sitting here in the service this morning. And an unbeliever can sing the songs that we sing. They can even pray. They can even read the scriptures. They can even participate in the offering, which is part of worship. But they cannot experience true worship. It's not me saying that. That's what the scripture says. That's what Jesus says. In order to be a true worshiper, you have to be saved. Listen to Hebrews 10, 19 to 24. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the new and the living way that He opened up for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a true heart, that's true worship in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's a safe person. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And then verse 24, let us consider how to stir up each other to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together as some people are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. <clears throat> you can only draw near to God. You can only worship God if you're saved. And then... Hebrews writer goes on to talk about an unbeliever's action. Verse 26. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, in other words, after you hear all of this and after you understand that the Lord Jesus Christ came to earth, died on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins and to offer us forgiveness and to clear our consciences, if after we hear all of that, we reject it and we keep on living our own life. In other words, sinning. It says there is no longer, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a fearful expectation of judgment. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, who has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. An unbeliever is somebody who profanes the blood of the covenant, doesn't care about the blood of the covenant. In fact, someone who hears the gospel 
and then rejects the gospel, ridicules the gospel, mocks the gospel, Hebrews says they are essentially trampling the blood of Christ underfoot. They're treating the cross like a doormat. There's only two kinds of people in the world, according to Scripture. Those who are saved and those who are unsaved. Believers and unbelievers. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, there's two roads in life. There are two gates, two groups of people, two destinations. There is a wide road and a narrow road. A wide gate and a narrow gate. And the wide road and the wide gate leads to destruction. The narrow gate and the narrow road leads to life. And Jesus said, most people, the popular choice is going to be the white gate and the white road. And most people are going to choose the white gate and the white road, and only a few people are going to choose the narrow gate and the narrow road that leads to life. And the people who choose the narrow gate and the narrow road are saved. They are believers. And they are the only ones who can truly worship. So when you get saved, that means you believe in Jesus Christ. John 1.12 says, But as many as received Christ to those who believed in his name shall be called children of God. That's a saved person. Romans 10.13 makes it even simpler. Everybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's how you get saved. But that begs the question, what on earth do I need to be saved from? Well, the Bible says we need to be saved from God's wrath. We need to be saved from God's judgment. We need to be saved from God's punishment. Because all of us have sinned. And all of us fall short of the glory of God. So you get salvation when you receive Christ, when you trust Christ, when you believe in Christ. And in that instant, you get regenerated. You become born again. You become spiritually alive. You become forgiven for all of your sins. You become cleansed. Your conscience becomes cleansed. The Holy Spirit takes up residence inside of you. The Holy Spirit fills you with the fruit of the Spirit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and hope and you become a new creature. You get illumination from the Holy Spirit to understand the Scriptures. If you're not saved, you're still in your sin, the Bible says. If you're not saved, you're spiritually dead. If you're not saved, you cannot understand spiritual things. If you're not saved, you, you cannot believe and accept the Bible as God's authoritative word. In fact, the Bible says you will think the Bible is foolish if you're not saved. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says the Bible is foolishness to an unbeliever, and he cannot understand spiritual things. This may seem unpleasant, but this is what the Bible teaches. An unbeliever cannot worship, because worship requires a spiritually alive heart, and a spiritually dead person can't worship. Only believers can experience true worship. Salvation is of the Jews. Now, number four, true worship is balanced. True worship is balanced. Look at verse 23. The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father, see, worship is about a person, not a place. Worship flows from an informed mind. Worship can only be experienced by saved people. And now, true worship is balanced. 
They will worship the Father, here's the balance, in spirit and truth. True worship does not worship in spirit or truth. Uh, true worship does not worship in one or the other. True worship worships in spirit and truth. That's the balance. Now, we're getting to the very heart of true worship here. Two things are needed to practice true worship. Spirit and truth. Now, let me explain these. Spirit is not the Holy Spirit. It's lowercase s. It's talking about your spirit. It's talking about the human spirit. It means true worshipers will worship from the heart, from the soul, from, from deep inside. It, it means you'll worship it with, with spirit. It, it, means, it means you'll worship like you mean it. it. It means to worship in sincerity. It means, uh, sincerity means without pretense. Sincerity means to be real, to be authentic. Jesus says true worshipers will worship in spirit, meaning you'll worship as if you mean it. You'll, you'll worship like it's real. You'll worship in an authentic way. One of the meanings of worship is to pay a high compliment to. Well, can you imagine if somebody paid you a compliment and they didn't mean it? You ever had somebody pay you a compliment and they didn't really mean it? I mean, people say to me all the time, Roy, you look so slim. <laughs> Somehow, that doesn't have the ring of truth. <laughs> In other words, when you worship it, it cannot be phony, it cannot be fake, it cannot be pretentious. And the way you feel when somebody pays you a compliment that you know is not, is not from the heart, they don't really mean it, God responds exactly the same to worship that is not real, that's pretentious, that... That, that's not sincere They're, when their heart's not in it. In fact, God said in Isaiah, you people are worshiping me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Your heart's not in it. True worship is worshiping with passion, with enthusiasm, with emotional affection. You see, you see this kind of worship all over the Psalms. We just sang one of those Psalms this morning. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. How, how can you say that without enthusiasm? Oh, bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. Yeah? Just doesn't seem right, does it? You worship in spirit. Psalm 96, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise. Oh, I love that. I love showing that to anybody who says they can't sing. Just make a joyful noise. Let us come with thanksgiving. See the enthusiasm in that? For the Lord is great, and he's a great king above all gods. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. What passion, what enthusiasm, what joy, what excitement. That's worship in spirit. Psalm 98 verse 4 says, shout to the Lord. It's okay to shout and bellow in the worship service. True worship flows from the heart. It's passion. It's enthusiasm. In fact, you know what the word enthusiasm means? It's, a, it's a, an English word from two Greek words. An meaning in or inside. And theos, which of course means God. In God, inside God. God on the inside. That's what enthusiasm means. God is on the inside. It's a beautiful word. Very appropriate for worship. Now, we all express our worship 
in different ways because we all have different personalities. I get that some of us are more expressive than others. I get that it, God made me loud. I get that. I'm loud. In fact, people have told me over the years that when they talk to me on the phone, they hold the phone out here. I get that. I'm loud. And I get that many, many other folks are very quiet and reserved. I get that. Some of us are more expressive than others. Some of us are less expressive than others. Please don't misunderstand and think that I'm suggesting that if you are more or less expressive than me that you're somehow wrong. I'm not saying that at all. You, you need to worship out of who you are. But what we should never do is express our worship according to what we think other people will think. For example, if you are moved in your spirit by the Holy Spirit to lift your hands in worship and praise, and I use this illustration because I've had this conversation with so many of you over the years who have said, I would like to lift my hands in worship, but I'm not sure how that would roll here. Not sure what folks would think. Friends, I just want to give you permission right now. If your spirit wants to lift your hands as an expression of worship and praise to the Lord, you should please do that. And you should not be worrying about what anybody else is thinking. Romans 14, 16 says, Don't let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. Now on the other hand, don't lift your hands to worship just because other people are doing it. You, you have to do it because you want to do it and because it's meaningful to you. If you're not inclined to raise your hands, you shouldn't raise your hands. But of course, needless to say, you also can't make judgments about other people who do raise their hands. In fact, Romans 14, 13 says, let us not pass judgment on each other any longer. If you want to shout out a praise to the Lord, or a praise the Lord, if you want to shout out a hallelujah, or a, man, that was a great point, particularly about the sermon. If you want to say that, you go right ahead and say that. That would, that would really encourage me. So long as you're sincere, of course. When we worship sincerely in spirit, we'll sing the songs sincerely and with enthusiasm and with volume. I mean, obviously, we have a multi-generational church family here. We, we have seniors who, who love the old familiar hymns. And we have young people who love the more modern hymns and songs. Now that is a gross generalization, I realize that. Because we have seniors who love modern music and we have some young people who love the old hymns. So it's a bit of a generalization, but you understand what I'm saying. But we plan what we call blended services here. We try to get a balance between old familiar hymns and newer modern songs in order to try to satisfy both preferences. So obviously that means all of us have to compromise a little bit, obviously. So maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're saying, well, you know what, I, I, don't, I don't sing some of the songs that we sing here because I've never heard that song before. Well, you understand that you can only say that once. <laughs> because once you've sung it once, you can no longer say, I've never heard that song. Well, weren't you listening just now when we were singing so once you've sung it once, now you've heard it. So now you can't say, I've never heard it before. So what you want to do is just take a hold of the rope and, and help us to sing it. Pull. Pull on the rope. And help us to sing it next time. And by adding your voice, there's going to be a collective voice of enthusiasm and volume 
that will be a sweet smelling savor to the Father. That's true worship in spirit. Or, or maybe you say, well, I, I didn't sing because, because I, I didn't like that song. Well, may I, need I remind you again that, that worship, true worship, is, is really not about whether you like the song or whether you like the music. I, I don't mean to burst your bubble, but true worship is not about whether you liked it. True worship is about whether God liked it. That's true worship. I mean, maybe you're saying to yourself, well, I don't think much of the sermon. Maybe you're thinking, you know, I've heard better preaching other places. Well, I'm sure you have, so have I. <laughs> but what we all think of the sermon doesn't really matter all that much. What matters is, was God pleased? And so long as the text is being faithfully and accurately and honorably and respectfully taught, then I'm confident that God is pleased. Uh, I don't think there's a sermon that goes by where I don't reflect back and say, oh, I wish I'd said this a bit different or that a bit different. But at the core of it, I'm confident I've, I've done my best to teach this word line by line, verse by verse, word by word, as accurately as I know how. So that it's not me telling you what to do and giving my opinion about what you ought to do, but it's God speaking to you. Was it true? Was it biblical? How do I need to change? These sermons better be changing me before they change you. Now we'll deal with this a little more next time when we get to it. But look at verse 23. The Father is seeking true worshipers to worship Him. Worship is all for Him. He's the audience, not us. He's the one who's looking for worshipers. So when we worship, the only thing that matters is what does He think of it? Did he like it? Did he enjoy it? Was he pleased with it? Was he honored by it? Was he glorified by it? The, the only evaluation that any of us really are capable of making in any given worship service is self-evaluation. Did I worship God today? Did I worship sincerely? Did I worship enthusiastically? Did I worship from the heart? Do I need to change? Or did I sit through the entire worship service with a critical spirit? With unconfessed sin in my heart? Or a cluttered heart like the thorny soil in the Four Soils parable, worried and distracted by the worries of life. That's why Hebrews 12 says, fix your eyes on Jesus. Then you won't be weary and discouraged. <clears throat> Worship is designed to lift the human spirit to lift you above your troubles and your sorrows and your pressures and let you gaze into the majestic, beautiful face of the glorified Christ. Nothing can help you with your pain like true worship. Well, that's the first part of a balanced worship. True worship True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit. Now the second half of balanced worship is this. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Now what on earth does it mean to worship the Father in spirit and truth? 
in truth. We'll hold that thought and we'll pick it up next time.